Good morning, happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. So I had a great, great weekend. Um, my buddy Mike Russell of Neuro Coffee fame sent me that. So these are chips that say the intensive and 16%. For those of you that are 16 percenters out there, very exciting. It's also um, metallic, so it sticks to my magnet that I have on my desk. So that's kind of exciting so it doesn't roll away. So anyway, um, so rolling to Monday with all the excitement from the weekend, I thought we'd just dive into a couple of Q&As that are similar. And it seems like uh, people are, are um, really focused in on, on wide infrastructural angles and questions associated with such. So, so let's dig in. Um, this is from Michael. And Michael says, I heard you say that you would side plank a wide infrastructural angle client. Can you go into detail as to why and what effect it has on the ribcage? Absolutely, I can. In fact, let me go get my homemade ribcage. So spine, somewhere around the fifth rib, sternum, first rib, just to give you a frame of reference. But when we're looking at a wide ISA, we're looking at that shape right there. So they are wider side to side than they are deep. And so if I was to do a, a typical plank under those circumstances where I'm looking down the line in, in that respect, because of the way that the diaphragm descends with a wide ISA, if I lay them, or if I put them in prone and I put them in symmetrical, I can actually reinforce the width position. So, so they're already wide side to side. And if I put them in prone under those circumstances, I don't really affect a, a favorable change in thorax shape. Now, if I take you to your side, so if I start you in a, in a wide position here and I take you to your side, all of the internal organs will fall because of gravity towards the, towards the downside. And so that gives me an enhancement in an anterior posterior direction right away. I also create a compressive strategy on the, on the downside. And so that means I'm gonna create an expansive strategy on the upside. And so now I get a, a situation where it looks kind of like that. So I actually teach the thorax to expand on one side and then when I flip them over and I do the other side I teach expansion on that side and that's usually the best way to make the shape change in a favorable direction when you have somebody that's in a wide infrastructure angle that I want to increase their anterior posterior diam diameter it's much easier to do on one side versus the other and so that's why we would choose a side plank versus something in, in prone um, as far as uh, you, you ask for progressions and regressions, it's beyond the scope of this type of an interaction, but there's a gajillion of them. In fact, I posted a couple of really, really simple progressions in a low oblique sit and high oblique sit that you can you can reference on uh, Instagram and YouTube. So so check those out. But but you know all you got to do is go through YouTube and you can look at any number of progressions. The goal when you're working with a client is just to make sure that you're putting in a position to be successful. So whatever your intent is then you got to put them in a in a situation where they can execute and be effective and so then we're always going to test intervene retest scenario however you determine that to be so hopefully michael that answers your question in regard to to the shape change of the thorax with the wide isa and why we would use the side plank yeah rondell was on the uh the free q a call that mike robertson and i did to introduce the uh the update to the IFAST University. And he had a question in regard to the um, expansion of, of, of the thorax. So we're still talking about anterior posterior expansion, but he wanted to make the comparison between the narrow ISA and, and the wide ISA. And, and I did make a comment that I would typically start with my, my wide ISAs face up and my narrow ISAs face down. Um, because of, once again, the shape of the diaphragm. So the, so the diaphragms are shaped totally differently in, in these two, two archetypes. And so, so with my narrows, I'm gonna have this, this sort of like increased AP diameter and a narrow side to side. And with my wides, 
I'm going to have a, an increased side to side diameter and then and narrow anterior posterior. And because of that, the diaphragm is actually in a different shape. And, and so we have to respect that. So once again, if I was to take a, uh, a wide ISA and I put them in a in a prone position or an inverted position, so hips higher than shoulders in, in prone, um, I, I may get an effect of an anterior posterior chain change rather, um, but it's probably not going to be as significant as it would be if I put them in supine um, to take advantage of the load of the guts on the posterior aspect of, of the thorax as far as promoting a favorable shape change to the diaphragm and then working it unilaterally. So let me give you an example of what that might look like. If we did a good old fashioned glute bridge and then brought one knee to the chest. And so we're doing a unilateral bridge. And what we're actually doing there is we're promoting a favorable shape change in the thorax. We're promoting a favorable position uh, for the diaphragm to achieve a position of, of normal exhalation. And I'm promoting unilateral compression and, and opposing expansion. So I, I get a big bang under those circumstances. That's why I would tend to start the the wider ISAs in a supine position and drive some form of unilateral uh, positioning. With the narrows with the face down, because of the shape of their diaphragm, they actually benefit from the load um, of, of the guts moving superiorly and anteriorly. So think about an inverted lazy bear position where I have the, the knees elevated in quadrupeds, so the hips are higher than the shoulders, and then I drop them down to the elbows. So now we have head lower, lower than hips. And so now we have a much more favorable position for that shape of the diaphragm and for, the, for increasing the width of, of the, the diameter of the thorax. So that's why we would choose those two strategies. Um, and that's why there's a little bit of difference between the, the wide ISAs and the narrow ISAs. If you're ever on the fence and you're not sure which way to go, do something. So again, it's always test, intervene, retest, and that's going to provide you the guidance. So if you're successful in your intervention, then you can you can move forward. If it if it's not successful, then try the opposing strategy because sometimes these things are confusing. Sometimes people are are very close to to being on the fence, so to speak, as to where they are predominantly wide or or, or narrow. Um, off topic from the from the ISA concept, I got a I got a question from uh, Sasha and and Sasha asks, um, I do have a question pertaining to the shoulder going into extension being an external rotation. And he's, he's talking in regards to, to, to arm swing and gait. And, and he said, would this fly in the face of what is commonly taught? Um, one, I, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to what is commonly taught, um, other than the fact that it is to, to um, create questioning as to what is really going on. But if you think about how the body moves during uh, gait, so if I was to, to swing my left arm forward and my right arm back, I actually orient my entire thorax into this right facing position. And so, so what people would, would tend to recognize going on at the shoulder would be shoulder extension. Um, and extension would typically be an internal rotation activity. However, when you think about the reorientation of the thorax and then the arm swing, I'm actually moving towards abduction, which is an external rotation measure. And so that's why that shoulder is actually moving towards external rotation rather than internal rotation. So that's a, that's a quick and easy answer for that. Um, as, to, as to how it's being taught, I, I think you're allowed your own perspective um, as long as the, the story fits the evidence and as long as it's a useful model. The question then becomes is, is um, how effective is that model in, in other circumstances and other contexts? The goal is to try to be as coherent as possible. My, my position would be that we're moving that shoulder into a position of, of external rotation during arm swing because of the reorientation of the thorax. So um, Sasha, I hope that answers your question. Uh, have a great, great Monday and I will see you guys tomorrow.